Hi, uh, I am Sabhisachi Roy. Uh, I am a software engineer at Facebook. Today I am going to talk about F4, Facebook's warm blob storage system. This is a joint work along with people from University of Southern California and Princeton University. Before we go into the details of our new system, let me define what we mean by blobs. So we all use Facebook. Have you noticed the kinds of things that takes up most of the real estate on your news feed or let's say your timeline? It's usually photos and sometimes videos. Photos and videos are great examples of blobs. Uh, more generally, a blob can be defined as a piece of data that is immutable and unstructured. And these blobs are usually written once, uh, read many times, and can sometimes be deleted. Uh, so essentially, blobs are read-only. Blobs are also very diverse. They vary by size, uh, type, access patterns, and the kinds of activity that they see. And finally, as you can imagine, we have a lot of them. One of the most interesting properties that blobs in our storage system exhibit is that they cool over time. This chart explains what I mean by that. Uh, the x-axis here is the age of the blobs, and the y-axis is the normalized rate of reads that uh, blobs of different age groups see. We are showing two blob types here, photos and videos, but these two constitute the vast majority of all the blob types that we have in our system. However, qualitatively, the results hold for other blob types as well. Uh, so what this chart shows, is when a blob is newly created, it sees a very high rate of reads. And uh, like, for example, you can imagine when you upload a photo, it shows up on the news feeds of all your friends. So everybody is looking at that photo, so that's why it's seeing a high uh, rate of reads. But as time passes, uh, that photo or that story uh, will roll off the news feeds, and the number of reads that it will see will slowly go down. The interesting thing to see here is the rate at which it, uh, the number of reads go down. So for example, in this case, we can see in just a matter of a single day, the number of reads seen go down by almost an order of magnitude. And in about one to three months, it goes down by another order of magnitude. So overall, the key observation here is that the data that we have cools off very rat rapidly with time. And based on this observation, we can split the, all the data that we have into two uh, rough categories. On the left side, we have the hot data. And on the right side, we have the warm data. Ideally, we would like to design a storage system that handles both of these cases efficiently. However, our traditional storage system was primarily built with hot data in mind, and uh, it had primarily two design goals. Uh, being a large storage system, it would see failures all the time, so one of the design goals was being able to handle different kinds of failures, and the second design goal was being able to handle the incoming uh, rate of reads or the incoming load. So I'll uh, go, uh, go into these two design goals in the next two slides. So how do we handle failures? So let's see what are the kinds of failures that we have. So the, the, the smallest uh, unit of storage in our storage system is typically a disk. Disks are contained within bigger hosts. But disks can fail. In order to handle such failures, we put the disks into something called hardware RAID 6 configuration. And what this, this gives us is the ability to handle uh, up to two disk failures. But this comes with an overhead of a factor of 1.2. Also, what happens if more disks fail? Or let's say the whole host failed. So one simple solution to guard against this is to have multiple copies. Specifically, we keep three copies of the data. Uh, uh, what this gives us is that for a failure not to be irrecoverable now, we'll have to lose nine disks, or we'll have to lose all the three hosts. Typically, these hosts are placed in completely different racks, and these racks are typically in completely different data centers. And what this means is that for the failure to be recoverable, we'll have to lose three racks or three complete data centers. Overall, such a configuration where we have a hardware rate that has an over overhead of 1.2 combined with three physical copies of the data gives us an overall replication factor of 3.6. What this means is that if we wanted to store one byte of data, we would use 3.6 bytes of disk space. Let's look at uh, how we handle load. So for a system handling uh, data that is mo mostly hot, uh, load is a big concern. And often, a single copy of the data is not enough to handle all the load. Uh, one simple solution to guard against it is to have multiple copies of the data, so the load gets distributed. And if that is not enough, we can continuously increase the number of copies that we have. Uh, 
the interesting thing again here to note is that having multiple copies not only saved us from, uh, not only helped us handle failures, but also helped us balance the load. And such a system, such a system uh, really makes sense for uh, handling data that is considered hot. Uh, but this comes at a cost of increased space usage. So in one of our slides, we saw that uh, the data that we have uh, shows a pattern where it cools off very rapidly with time. Given that observation, the question is, can we do better or not? And specifically, given that we have a large number of uh, large amount of warm data in our system where load is not that big of a concern, uh, the question is, can we reduce the space usage and yet not uh, compromise on any of the reliability guarantees? The good thing is the answer to this question is yes, and the rest of the presentation is how, how we achieved it. Before we go into the details of the new system, here is a quick background on some of the concepts that we'll need to know. This is a very high-level architectural diagram of how our storage stack looks like. Uh, most of our blobs show some kind of temporal locality, so we have a layer of CDN uh, that takes up most of the read requests that are coming in, uh, and hence reduces the uh, load on the storage system. Whatever misses the CDN goes to a layer, a router layer. Uh, router layer essentially uh, is a layer of abstraction on top of the blob storage layer. Uh, it gets in requests for reads and writes and redirects them as appropriate. The writes typically come in and are handled by our web servers, which usually add some business logic on top of it and then forward the request to our router layer, which then forwards it to the blob storage layer. Our blob storage system itself runs over a large fleet of machines, with each machine running our storage driver Haystack. Haystack was a paper published in OSDI 2010. Haystack introduced the concept of volumes. Volumes are essentially very big append-only files that contain a series of blocks, a uh, series of blobs. Uh, Haystack also maintains an in-memory index of the blob ID to the offset uh, within which a particular blob resides. Uh, this design allows Haystack to be able to read a blob uh, by doing at most one disk I/O. With that background, we are ready to introduce F4, our warm blob storage system. F4 can be conceptually thought of as Haystack running on something called cells. But what are cells? Cells can be thought of as very big hosts. Cells typically have a bunch of storage resources. This storage is uh, usually in the form of disks spread over a bunch of hosts. These hosts are typically distributed over some racks. Uh, these hosts also have some memory resources uh, that, that allows it to hold the in-memory index. Typically, a storage will also have some compute resources. Uh, the use of this compute resource will become clear in one of the later slides. Just uh, as our hot storage system, uh, F4 or a warm storage system also sees uh, different kinds of failures. So some of the common failure patterns are, let's say, disks failing, or hosts failing, or racks failing. All these failures are failures local to the cell, but in an extreme case, the whole cell can fail as well. In the next few slides, we'll uh, see how we designed F4 to handle each of these uh, failures. In order to handle cell local failures, such as host, disk, and rack failures, we encode the data. How we encode the data and how we place it in the cells is key to how effectively F4 can handle the different failure situations. So uh, we usually move whole volumes to the F4 cells. So in this example, we have a 10 gig volume. Uh, after moving the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the path of moving the volume, we also split the volumes into smaller blocks. So in this example, we have split the 10 gig uh, volume into 10 1 gig blocks. Then we group those blocks. Each group, uh, we apply read Solomon encoding to each of these groups to generate some parity blocks. The group of data and parity blocks thus formed is called a stripe. In this example, we are using a read Solomon uh, 5 to encoding scheme. Uh, what this means is that we can generate any block within the stripe given any five other blocks within the same stripe. There are two important things that I want to point out here. Uh, the first thing is how we lay out the blobs, individual blobs within the block. So we try to make sure that individual blobs complete, completely reside within a single block so, so that they do not uh, cross block boundaries. And this is to make sure that the number of uh, reads or the number of IOs that we'll have to do is at most one uh, when we read a blob. The second thing relates to how the read Solomon uh, encoding applies. Uh, so ju ju just as all the blocks in a stripe are related by the read Solomon encoding, the same relationship also applies to any offset range within the blocks. Uh, 
So what this means is that if we were to decode any offset range within the block, we can read the corresponding offset ranges within other blocks of the same stripe and still be able to decode the data, which means that when decoding a small amount of data, we don't need to necessarily read all the other blocks in the stripe. So we have talked about uh, how we encode the data. Next, let's look at how we place the data. So data placement, uh, uh, how we place the data impacts how well we can handle all the different kinds of cell local failures. Uh, in this example, we have a cell with seven racks. The way we place the data is as follows. We take every block in a stripe and put it in a different rack within the cell. Since this is, uh, again, Reed solomon 5 to encoding, what this gives us that we can tolerate two random rack failures and still be able to recover the blocks uh, that we lost due to the uh, rack failures by using the Reed solomon decoding process. In practice, we use uh, Reed solomon 10 for encoding, which means that typically our cells contain at least 14 racks. This comes with a uh, storage overhead of 1.4x. And as you can imagine, this helps us, this allows us to tolerate up to four random rack failures. Since rack is a bigger unit of storage, uh, this also means that we can tolerate uh, any random four disk and any random four host failures. That concludes uh, the design of F4. Let's look at how uh, this design enables us to do reads in production. So let's look at, look at the simple case first. A user request comes in. The router, makes, the router does the data read in two steps. The first step is an index read. The index read returns the exact physical location where the blob being requested resides. Using that data, the router then makes the second step of the read, which is the data read. So once the data, it fetches the data, it returns it back to the user, and that's done. But what happens, let's say, if there are failures in the system? So in this case, for example, the data read failed because some physical location holding the blob failed. In that case, the router will issue a third step, which is the decode read. The decode read will hit one of the hosts in the compute resources. That host will then fetch uh, the, uh, the exact offset range it needs from the other blocks within the same stripe. It gets the data back, does the re uh, read Solomon decoding of the data, and returns the data back to the router. This is how we handle most of the cell local failures, such as disk, host, and rack failures. But what happens under bigger failures, such as data center failures? So one simple solution to handle this is to have another mirror copy of the cell in a completely different data center. So in this case, when a user request comes in and it finds that the local cell is dead or unreachable for some reason, it will just proxy the request to a remote router, which will then make a local data read call and return the result back to the original router. Uh, what, what this gives us is two mirror cells, each having an overhead of 1.4 coming from the Reed solomon encoding. So thus we get an overall replication factor of 2.8, which is much better than what we used to have in Haystack, which is 3.6. But can we do better? The answer is yes if we use cross uh, data center encoding. The particular kind of cross data center encoding that we use is uh, very simple, it's XOR. So in this example, we have three cells in three data centers. We pick two volumes in the two data centers, uh, XOR them, and create a third volume in the third data center. So this handles the data, data redundancy uh, across data centers uh, to handle data center failures. But as we have seen uh, in one of the previous slides, in order for a data read to success, uh, succeed, we need to do also index reads. So we need some kind of redundancy to, uh, for indexes as well to be able to handle data center failures. And for this, we just simply replicate the index across data centers. Uh, each such, uh, uh, so uh, by this process, we created essentially three volumes, two data volumes and one XOR volume. Uh, each set of three, each such set of three volumes is uh, called a triplet. And we apply the same logic to other volumes in three cells to create more triplets. As a result of this XORing, uh, we basically fill a cell completely with two parts of data volumes and one part of XOR volume. And this means that XOR adds an overhead of 1.5. This combined with the overhead of 1.4 coming from Reed solomon encoding gives us an overall replication of 2.1, which is better than the previous scheme that we discussed, 2.8. Let's look at how this scheme handles uh, data center failures. So let's say a user request comes in, and the local cell read failed because the local cell had failed. 
So in that case, the router will make a remote index read request. Based on the data returned by the index read, it will proxy data read request to the uh, two uh, remote routers, which will then make local data read calls, get the data back. The original router will then exhort the data and return the result back to the user. That completes the design part of F4. Here is a quick uh, comparison of the three systems we have seen so far, Haystack, F4 2.8, and F4 2.1. So clearly, F4 does very well in terms of uh, space usage and handling most of the failures, such as disk host and rack failures. The two things that it does not do as well in uh, are data center failures. So for example, in Haystack, in order for a failure to be irrecoverable, we'll have to lose three data centers, whereas in the F4 scheme, only uh, two data center losses make the da makes the data irrecoverable. However, in practice, this is uh, a good enough failure guarantee because data center failures are extremely rare. The second thing is uh, load. So uh, in, in, the, uh, because Haystack keeps three copies of the data, so obviously uh, the load balancing properties will be better there. Uh, but in the evaluation section, we'll sh uh, show why, uh, even though the load balancing is not as good as Haystack, F4 is still able to handle the load, primarily because the kind of data that it stores is warm, where load is not that big of a concern. Now, let's go through some evaluation that shows whether F4 system is effective or not. In this talk, we'll talk about two major points. Uh, the first one is what data and how much of it can be considered warm. This will dictate the impact of uh, F4 on the overall storage system that we have. Uh, the second one is about whether F4 can satisfy the latency and the throughput requirements that we have. There is a bunch of analysis in the paper regarding how much space does F4 actually save and how failure re resilient F4 is, uh, but I'm, not, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Quick look at the method methodology. Uh, we uh, collect a lot of data traces. Uh, there are basically two classes, uh, traces from the CDN accesses. We collected it over a period of one day with a sampling percent of 0.5 and blob store data access. This is essentially the data access uh, that our blob storage system sees. This was collected over a period of two weeks with a sampling, period, uh, sampling percent of 0.1%. We make two assumptions in our analysis. Uh, the first one is the blobs are pretty much randomly distributed uh, on the disks. And the second thing is that we always report the worst case or the peak loads or read requests. And this is because most of our provisioning is based on the worst case or the peak loads and not the average load, for example. This slide will help us uh, determine when, when to consider data as warm and move it to F4. So in this slide, we show how the absolute rate of reads uh, change over time uh, for photo blobs. The x-axis here is, again, uh, the age of the photo blobs. And the y-axis is the absolute rate of reads per disk. Specifically, what this means is uh, that if we filled up a typical disk that we use in our system completely with uh, photo blobs of a certain type, this is the rate of reads that it will see um, in reality. Uh, the red line marks the 80 reads per second mark. Uh, this, this is uh, the safe max that the kinds of disks that we have in our F4 system can safely tolerate and uh, efficiently handle. What this graph shows is that in about three months, the photo blobs cool down to a level uh, so that they are ready to be considered warm or move to F4. Uh, so essentially what this is saying that any photo blobs this is, which is greater than three months old, uh, we can move it to F4. Uh, note that uh, photos is one of our hotter object types. Uh, most of the other object types are much cooler than what photos is, and usually they cool down much faster. So for example, videos will cool down below the 80 reads per second mark in the first week itself. So we can potentially move them um, much before the three month mark. What this graph uh, also, uh, also means uh, is that any data that is greater than three months old, we can move it to F4. And as you can imagine, we have a lot of data that is more than three months old, uh, which means that there is a lot of data that qualifies as warm data, and we can move it to F4, hence uh, increasing the effectiveness of, of F4 as a warm uh, storage system. This graph shows what is the split of the reads seen by the hot data and the warm data. Uh, the vertical line here corresponds to the three-month mark, so anything to the right of it is considered warm and right, left of it is considered hot. Uh, what this graph shows is the number of reads is split evenly among the hot and warm data. Uh, uh, from an F4 point of view, what this means is that although the kind of blobs that it stores is warm, uh, 
the total or the aggregate number of reads that it sees is still a very high significant percentage uh, of reads. And which means uh, that it is important for F4 to be designed in a way uh, that it can handle this load efficiently and guarantee, uh, give all kinds of performance guarantees. So let's see whether F4 does well in terms of these performance metrics or not. Uh, this graph uh, shows whether F4 is able to handle the incoming load or not. Uh, this, is, this graph shows the uh, absolute rate of reads that a typical disk in one of our worst clusters, worst in terms of being mostly loaded, cluster C. So what this graph shows is that the peak load that we see on the disk is about 35 reads per second. This is well below the limit that we looked at earlier of 80 reads per second. And even if we assumed uh, that there were data center failures, that will increase this only by a factor of two, and that will still stay below uh, the limit of 80 reads per second. Uh, let's look at how F4 performs in terms of latency. Uh, the P80 latency that F4 sees is very reasonable. It's about 30 milliseconds. And the P99 is about 80 milliseconds. So although this is not as good as uh, what Haystack has, but this is very reasonable as far as co uh, giving quality of service guarantees as concerned. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude the talk with some uh, quick uh, recap of what we have seen so far. So we have seen that we store a large number of blobs, and uh, the amount of data that we store is always growing. But we have also seen an interesting trend in how the access rates of this data goes down over time. Essentially, it goes down very fast. So for example, in just 60 days, it goes down by a factor of 100x. For such warm data, where load is not that big of a concern, Haystack's 3.6x replication is actually kind of over-provisioning. That lays the foundation of our work, which is F4. F4 uh, does better than Haystack by doing uh, cell local intra DC encoding and uh, across DC XORing uh, to get a much lower replication factor of 2.x. Thanks. We have time for some questions. Marcos Aguilar, fired by Microsoft Research. I was wondering if uh, you didn't talk much about the bandwidth utilization when you have failures, and, and in particular when you have data center failures by using the XOR technique, you're going to have lots of data flying between data centers, right? And, and I wonder if, if that's not going to be a problem. Okay. Uh, so basically your question is when a data center failure happens, whether the amount of data that we'll have to read, whether it's a problem or not. Well, in particular, the, the bandwidth utilization across data centers is going to be spiking at that point for recovery, right? Right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a fair question. Uh, so I think there are two points here. Uh, first of all, the data center failures are very rare where you have a complete data center outage for multiple hours, let's say. So usually when these things happen, it's like a network uh, outage, so it should be temporary. But when these things happen, yes, we are reading a lot of data. But the way we designed our system, so we took care of, so we basically did some calculations of how much of data we have to read, and these were well below what our backbone supports. So we should be able to handle those loads. Yes. Okay, sitting from NetApp, so I'm kind of curious about a throughput on each storage node. I didn't show that in the slide. The uh, throughput of uh, each storage node. Uh, like uh, I had a graph about the, the kinds of loads that the disks see. Is that not what? You uh, but uh, can you show that in the throughput? I mean, in so that uh, the second? the rates of reads that the disks see basically translate into uh, what the rates of reads will look like uh, on every host. So actually, the paper has a graph which also shows these numbers on a per host per rack basis. Uh, and uh, usually, like a very rule of thumb would be just to sum up uh, all the read rates that each of the individual disks see in a particular host, and that will be what the read rates uh, that are seen by a particular host. I ask this question because I'm kind of curious. Uh, in the paper, you wrote that uh, in each uh, node there are 30 disks, but I guess for the uh, networking, it should be a 10 gig uh, uh, Ethernet. So yeah. um, that's kind of a strange configuration because uh, we have done some uh, uh, tests before uh, in our system. So kind of uh, 15 no uh, disks can saturate that uh, 10 gig Ethernet but you got a certain and disk. Not at the rates of reads that we see. I mean, we can talk offline about the absolute numbers, but okay. uh, definitely if we like sum up all the reads that we see on all the disks, that does not saturate the network. Uh, okay, the sure, thanks.
Hey, this is Jonas Wagner from EPFL. I just wondered if there is any complication in handling writes or if you can actually handle writes to cold data. I mean, users might want to delete their old pictures, for example. Great. So, uh, yeah, there are two points here. So um, let's talk about the deletes first. Uh, at the, and the paper uh, sort of talks about how we handle deletes. Uh, so the way we do it is uh, we encrypt the data that we write to this warm storage system and store the keys in a separate system, which is read-write. And all the deletes then go to that system. Uh, so that's how we handle the writes coming in from the deletes. But generally, like online writes that we are not handling in the warm storage system, that is still handled by our old Haystack system. Okay. That sounds very smart, yeah. Thank you. Thanks.